So, yeah, so welcome to, I guess, to LPC. Uh, and thank you for uh, having me on the referee track. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, so I am going to talk, this talk uh, basically today is the RAS Monday, let's say in LPC, because we have uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, RAS talks uh, through the day. Uh, starting with this one, then we have two uh, compilers and the alternate compilers of Rust, and then we have one in the kernel summit. And the kernel summit one, what I have done is more or less have it as a follow-up of this one. So here in this talk, I will introduce uh, what is Rust, why we, why we would like to have Rust uh, in different projects, and then the kernel summit one uh, will be more focused on, 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 on the kernel, on the use case of the kernel. So as you know, uh, uh, most of you probably know, uh, one project, uh, Rust for Linux, is a project that uh, tries to um, answer the question whether we want Rust in the kernel, whether it's a good idea or not, uh, what are the challenges, etc., etc. Um, and uh, I'm leading that effort along with, uh, with uh, Alex and Wesson, which are the other maintainers, and a lot of other people. So first of all, I wanted to, even if it is not too related uh, to the general talk or this talk, uh, I wanted to give the credit uh, uh, to everyone, uh, Raz, for being uh, uh, in, in, the, in the field of system programming languages, for being a, a breath of fresh air, because it's really uh, has some new ideas uh, and very nice things about it. Uh, to kernel maintainers, again, even if it is this more for the other talk, uh, I want to thank you, kernel maintainer, for being open-minded and for everyone that uh, you are listening to this talk about Rust and perhaps you are interested in knowing more about Rust. And uh, also, I'm sorry for the pointer, I will move it out of the slides. Uh, everyone that has helped us uh, for Linux in one way uh, or another, uh, please see the credits. A lot of people uh, have been really helpful and, uh, and I cannot uh, stress enough uh, a lot the, the, all the support that we have had. And with that, Okay, sorry, I got muted somehow there. So with that, let's move forward. As you know, two days ago, I think, uh, yeah, on, on Saturday, we celebrated uh, the 30 year uh, anniversary of uh, Linux, basically of the first uh, public release or the first public tarball. Uh, but we, will, we also have uh, 30 years of C. In this case of the standardized C, not of C, of course, but uh, I picked this is the date uh, or I think the standardized version of C because it matches nicely with the 30 years of Linux. So we have 30, year, 30 years of Linux uh, and C. And it's not only Linux, it's, uh, as you know, C, the programming language has been used in Unix, uh, was designed partially to, to write Unix as well. So basically the, the two histories, both Linux and Unix, et cetera, et cetera, and all the utilities, all the operating system, the new tools, et cetera, et cetera, everything has been uh, tied uh, in one way or another uh, to C. Even if you have a project that does not use directly C, perhaps you are using C++ or you are using another language that does uh, foreign uh, interface uh, through, through C, through a C uh, description of the, of the ABI. So in a way, uh, we are celebrating those two things together. And I start with this because uh, I want to talk about, about C and then why, coming from the C side, why uh, Rust may be a good idea. As we know as well, uh, it has not been, at least in the kernel, and probably in other projects as well, it has not been, it has not been all uh, ups and downs, uh, it has not been all a uh, smooth uh, story. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, in the kernel, we don't exactly use the standard C, we use, you know, extensions, we use uh, all kinds of flags that uh, change some of the semantics or define some behavior that is not uh, defined. Uh, we have also some differences with respect to the memory model, et cetera, et cetera. So not everything is basically, uh, of course, uh, standard C, but we can say that uh, uh, C is, uh, is a good fit for things. Uh, but why? What is that? So this question, the one that I'm going to show now in the, in the slides, this question, do you see any language except C, which is suitable for development of operating systems, was asked to, to Torvalds, uh, to Linux, uh, like nine months, nine years ago, sorry. And uh, he answered basically the following. Sorry, I'm trying to keep, I tried to move the slides with the arrows and I keep uh, having to go with the mouse. So he says, I like interacting with hardware from a software perspective, and I have to yet see a language that comes even close to C. So this uh, is quite a strong statement because, of course, uh, uh, we are now here today looking at 
perhaps we want uh, better languages or, or have an evolution of, of that. So why he was saying in particular uh, that C was a good language for, in his case, for kernels? Uh, first of all, because it's fast. So as you see here, um, we can use it to generate fast code, to generate good code for, for a particular hardware. We will see why. There is uh, also the fact that it's low level, so you read some C and you can easily map uh, what is assembly, how, what, what, what the instructions are going to look like, more or less. Um, sometimes it's hard because of optimizations, et cetera, et cetera, but in general, you can map easily uh, how it's going to look like. And then uh, we also have um, that is simple, it's a simple language uh, compared to others, at least, it's, it's fairly simple. And it fits the domain. I read this last quote from Torvalds as fits the domain. Uh, C is a language that, uh, well, it fits writing, for example, better systems or low-level tools because, of course, it was written basically for that purpose. So, there is, that's what is good about C, right? But there is a, a small uh, problem, if we want to call it a problem. It's not so much a problem, but it's more on the how C is designed, you know, what the properties of C is, is basically a, a consequence of the design, which is uh, undefined behavior. And I put here these uh, informal emojis because it's, this is a scary thing, right? That uh, everyone, uh, when he's learning C, talks about uh, like, oh, this is undefined behavior. You, you are uh, going to, uh, basically, uh, the compiler is going to be able to do anything with your program, which is uh, actually um, pretty much true, at, at least if we look into the standard. So here's the standard definition. Uh, which for those of you that perhaps don't know, I guess most of you know, it basically says whenever you hit undefined behavior in your code, whether it's a runtime or not, it doesn't matter. Whenever you, you have some semantics that are not defined by the standard, then the compiler or the program can do whatever they, they like. So whatever uh, happens uh, can happen. Uh, this has some consequences uh, that we will uh, talk about a bit more. Um, but this is basically the key that is what Rust is offering. So, for example, let's see an example first of what is undefined behavior. Undefined behavior, as you know, um, divided by zero, you have program uh, we, we see quite a while, you, you know that divided by zero uh, is, is undefined behavior. So, for example, in this function, the trivial function, right, there is a possibility of triggering undefined behavior when you pass the right argument. So, in this case, um, there's undefined behavior if you call with a zero in the second argument, whatever the first argument is, it doesn't matter. Uh, of course, if you have not, uh, this is not like the syntactical, if, if X is, for example, an abort, of course, the program will not perform the call, but assuming that the call is performed, if you call with zero, then it's undefined behavior. There is also another case uh, here, which is uh, this one that uh, I mentioned for, for completeness. But the point is that this function, when we call this function, the compiler can, when generating the code, can assume that this will not happen. So it doesn't need to check whether B is zero or not. It just says, okay, if B is zero, I, I don't have to care about that case. So for example, in, in some architectures, uh, dividing by zero may raise a hardware exception or interrupt. Um, and therefore, since the semantics of this language does not care about that, we can say, okay, we don't need to care about that. We can do the addition right away. We can just uh, create that extraction, only that extraction without guarding that, that part. And that's it, because if it happens, well, we have we had the freedom to to, avoid, to ignore that case, and not only that, it's also that now the compiler and smart compilers what they do is say go backwards and say, well, I I am not going to only ignore what B is, so I am not going to ignore uh, the B zero case, the B equals zero case, but I am also going to assume that it's not zero because if I reach this this state, uh, I can assume it didn't happen. So this is what optimizers uh, basically start inferring these kind of things, and then they change these inferences. So they create inference chains that then arrive sometimes to to, to code that is a bit surprising, and, and, and in some cases actually create uh, vulnerabilities because we don't expect. I mean, the, the code has a bug in terms of the standard, but still it creates uh, vulnerabilities that perhaps we don't expect. And with that, I'm going to give you very quickly like a bit of a fun slide. What is undefined behavior? These are come from the NXJ, from the standard, and it's basically a list of all the undefined behavior that C has. And as we can see here, I have highlighted, uh, I just of can use the pointer here, but I have highlighted uh, four keywords, for example, of things that are very related or may, you have may have heard of uh, when talking about undefined behavior. So there is 
things about trap representation or invalid inhabitants of a type. We have things about pointers, going out of bounds, for example, double free, etc. Et we have lifetime, lifetimes as well, which is related also to the pointers. So, for example, if you try to use an object that is already gone from the, from, from the point of view of the standard, uh, then it's an inside behavior. We have data races as well. So, all these things uh, are, are, are things that are undefined behavior in C. So, having this and knowing what is C, what is our advantage of C, and what is the basically the big disadvantage, what does Rust offer? And there is one single thing that Rust offers us, which is the following it doesn't have undefined behavior in the safe subset. There are some things that have to apply to, for this to be true, for example, the unsafe code that you may have heard about doesn't have to, can, cannot contain bugs because if you have a bug there, then you can uh, create undefined behavior nonetheless. So there is some conditions need to apply. But the point is that in the safe subset and modular bugs, so ignoring bugs that could uh, have happened in, in, in some place like in C or any other language, Rust does not have undefined behavior in the safe subset. And this is a key, key thing. And this is why we, I think Rust is growing so much uh, in the field of uh, system programming languages. And I want to talk a bit about exactly what it means to be safe because I, I have talked about what is undefined behavior and Rust does not have undefined behavior of the safe Rust language, the safe. Uh, and this is exactly what safety is. So when they, when you have, may have heard about Rust and what is safety in Rust, right? Like some people say, oh, it's memory safe, which is true, it's type safe, which is true, etc., etc. But the key is that when, when we say something is safe in Rust, what we mean is there is no undefined behavior. Here, undefined behavior is used in the sense of C. Rust has a very similar definition, but the point is all the things we have uh, discussed uh, so far, for example, out of bounds and these things we have mentioned, pointers, etc., etc., these are all undefined behavior. And Rust, what guarantees is that there is no undefined behavior. And critically, and this is something that I have seen in online, different online fora, is that there's some confusion about, about this because some people may think that safety has something to do with safety critical, for example, or whether a program has more or less logic bugs. And this is completely different. So it's, it's important. It's important to understand that safety in Rust is not safety as in safety critical. So in functional safety, you have, like for example, for airborne uh, applications or things that go in trains, cars that control, for example, the driving system, all these things. You can write them in C. And they are written in C in many cases. So it's not so much about the language. Functional safety is more about the process, the requirements. It's about the independence of QA. It's about the traceability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's different than safety in Rust, and it doesn't actually doesn't have much to do or anything to do. So we could say um, perhaps writing a program in Rust, perhaps maybe less costly, perhaps we don't know. Uh, if instead of using C, but for the functional safety part, it doesn't really matter. So in the end, you have to do the same kind of certification regardless of the language that you pick. In the future, actually, Rust, you will be able to probably use Rust for safety critical projects. And there are some um, companies and, and groups that are working on that already. Uh, but again, what I want to make really, really clear here is that safety in Rust has nothing to do with safety critical systems. So let's take an example from C to try to clarify uh, this or try to make it even more clear. Abort. Abort is a function that if you have programming C, it's from the standard library, as, uh, as you may know, it terminates the program in a normal manner, but it terminates the program, right? So basically, it exits the process and does it. So this is safe in terms of Rust because abort in C doesn't trigger an if behavior on its own. So calling abort is completely fine. So there's no if behavior, and therefore, we consider that Rust, right? And this applies even if your company goes completely out of business. Because imagine that you call abort in your server, you start losing customers because you lost a lot of money. It doesn't matter, this was safe. So we need not need to, this is, uh, I try to emphasize this because this is again the distinction between what is safety in Rust and what is safety in other contexts. And similarly, like in the functional safety context, even if someone is injured because you call abort, that is still safe in terms of Rust. Because it's not an environment here. So let's let's uh, take a look at a, at a very small, uh, very simple function, right? Uh, and let's see the, the function that we had before, which was divided by zero, right? And divided by well, basically divided by a divided by b. And there were some cases that we can see here as well. 
So since C abort and C abort is safe in terms of Rust, what happens if we break this into the function? Basically, we are guarding the two cases, right? We are guarding the division by zero case and we are guarding the other case for completeness. So in this case, whatever we do, whatever the inputs are, A and B, when we reach the vision, we know there's not going to be any undefined behavior. This is one way of avoiding undefined behavior, and I don't want to give the impression that Rust, what it does is always checking um, every single parameter or things like that before any operation. This is not how it works. In some cases, it has to do that, but this is not trying to imply that. What I'm trying to show here is the concept of avoiding undefined behavior or trying to write functions that do not contain undefined behavior in any um, path that you can think. Uh, so for any inputs here, there is no different behavior for the function. You cannot trigger, you cannot reach that state. And in this case in Rust, we call it safe. So f here is a safe function. So we, we would say in Rust that this f is a safe function. Uh, and please, uh, if you have a quick question or something, uh, let, let me interrupt you if, if you want, if this is not clear. So similar to our team C, we have also what Rust calls panics. You can think of similar, that they are similar, especially if the panic uh, is configured to abort, then it's very similar to, to an abort in C. And panics in Rust, so killing the application, basically stopping your system, let's, let's say, is safe. But not only that, if we are, for example, in the context of the kernel, like we will discuss in, in, in the other talk, this is also safe. A kernel panic is safe, is considered safe in terms of that definition. Of course, a kernel panic, like Calling abort in your program is nothing. It's, it's not. It's not. It's not something that is uh, desirable or something that uh, we want to do, of, obviously. But this is, in terms of the definition, is safe. So what is not safe? And this is the critical thing that Rust provides. So all the things we discussed about and we highlighted in the other slide about, for example, out of bound accesses that we see here, uses after free, null dereferences, double freeze. Uh, trap representations, invalid inhabitants, etc., and initialized memory reads. All these things are not Russian. This means that in C, for example, all these things would trigger undefined behavior. In Rust, in safe Rust, in the safe subset that they call of Rust, this cannot happen. Rust guarantees that this thing will not happen in your program, again, if unsafe code is uh, bug free, etc., etc., etc. And also here I want to point out data races, because this is actually um, a huge one. Uh, when you're programming, you're doing multi threaded programming, for example, it's also a huge one that it prevents, which is also undefined behavior in C. And with this sentence here, even if your system still works, what I want to point out is that um, so, sometimes, for example, right now, you're listening to this presentation, you're using a browser, you're using an operating system, and it's likely, or it's somehow likely, if it is program in C, et cetera, et cetera, that you have triggered, at some point, the program has triggered undefined behavior. Or perhaps, a, I mean, it, perhaps it has not, but at some point you have seen a, a program that has a bug or has a crash, et cetera, et cetera. If that came from undefined behavior, it means that sometimes, even if you don't notice undefined behavior, for example, your program is corrupting some memory or is reusing some piece of memory that is shouldn't, perhaps even in other cases it works, and you think it works. And that's why we have vulnerabilities that we discovered later on. We, we, we think that the program you are using, for example, your browser, it works, it works perfectly fine. But then you see in the news, oh, this has a vulnerability. And that's why, that, that's, sorry, that, that, that uh, they have vulnerabilities precisely because there is some cases of undefined behavior. Um, well, not for all vulnerabilities, of course, I'm talking about the ones that come from memory safety, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, sometimes the systems work or appear to work, even if you have triggered undefined behavior. So this is basically the opposite or the reverse of what we saw uh, in the other slide about the business critical things and calling up. Another point is that race conditions uh, are safe. Uh, this, by race conditions here, I mean the regenerative race conditions. For example, you open a file, you check a file, you check that a file exists, for example, and then you open the file. If somebody has deleted the file in between, this is a classical case of a race condition, this class cannot prevent. So, this is safe and having such a race condition is safe. But this is different from data races. Data races are defined like in the C standard, they are defined as two threads accessing a single memory location, right? Where one is a writer at least, and at least you have one that is not synchronized. So if that case happens, then you have a data race and that's the case that Rust prevents. That's why I, I, I mentioned that it's very nice to, for, for multi-threaded programming and, and, and 
things like that. But general race conditions, they are not prevented. And that's the source of uh, another uh, uh, confusion point, let's say, uh, that I see in, uh, when people discuss Rust and, and the guarantees of Rust. Then we have memory leaks, which is similar. Rust, even if in the majority of cases, Rust does not uh, have memory leaks or idiomatic Rust is, is hard. You have to make, for example, you have to make a Rust-like structure. You have to manually forget, uh, they call it forget, uh, forget some, some object or things like that. In the vast majority, the vast majority of cases, already, you will not have memory leaks. But it's not guaranteed. So there's a difference. Even if it usually doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed. And in this case, no leaks are not guaranteed. And, and actually, um, forgetting memory, leaking memory, is completely uh, safe. And does not trigger those uh, unfindability. Deadlocks are also safe, similar reasons. You can go into a deadlock. It doesn't mean it's a program that is correct, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's safe. So Rust does not prevent this case. Uh, even if it is perhaps hard in your program to get there, there or you design your program so that you don't have those blocks of code, but still, trust does not guarantee that that's the case. Integral overflows, uh, this is a bit tricky because we can get into what uh, what uh, exactly an integral overflow and what are the consequences of an integral overflow, for example, if you then use it uh, as an index into an array, for example. But trust, again, integral overflows are defined. They are not undefined, like in the, at least in the old version of the C standard. They are defined to overflow, but it's considered an error. So if you have an integral overflow in Rust, it's considered an error, but it's not undefined behavior. The compiler cannot uh, infer things if you overflow your, your integers. And then something orthogonal is whether the compiler adds checks or not to your program to, to see whether that overflow happened or not. So for example, the Rust compiler has an option to uh, abort or punish your program if there is an integral overflow that you can enable or not. But Regardless of that check, it's not a defined behavior. So we have talked about uh, defined behavior and, and uh, well, the different kinds, etc., etc. But someone may ask, okay, yes, this is uh, fine. Uh, C has uh, this undefined behavior thing, which actually some of you may have heard that is good, for example, for optimization, but is avoiding is so critical. So why do we want actually to avoid undefined behavior? And the answer is um, because undefined behavior in C and C++ projects, it amounts to 70% of, of, the, of the vulnerabilities. So if you take all the vulnerabilities, and roughly 70%, some projects is more, some projects is less, but roughly 70% comes from undefined behavior memory safety. Um, and we see here, and I will not get into, into, uh, into all these uh, blocks or anything like that, but there is many companies that have asserted this, this, this fact, basically, of this, uh, they have tried to they have taken some numbers and they have seen that this more or less is the is a number. The 70% is a number that they all report in one way or another. So we have, for example, Microsoft that is reporting that 70% of the vulnerabilities uh, they have memory safety issues. We have uh, Apple as well. Uh, some folks have uh, measured, basically counted of the total vulnerabilities uh, published, which are the ones that come from memory and safety. You, you can think that as a proxy to, to, to UB. And what is the percentage? And as you can see, uh, it goes around the 70%. There is also Chromium. The Chromium project has also published this, where they claim that 70% uh, of the serious security bugs are memory safety problems. So we have also um, Google has posted uh, uh, some numbers on Android, and they claim that 90% of the vulnerabilities um, are these ones, which are the free in the overflows, uh, out of bounds, uh, read and write, etc. Et so, as you can see, um, this is a problem. So, if we can, we could say, if we can take unfair behavior out of the way, it may be true, or it could be that we reduce, uh, we take away all the 70% uh, from the vulnerabilities we have. We also have here a, a Fish in a Barrel, it's a, it's, a, it's a Twitter account that posts. Um, the vulnerabilities in recent, uh, as, you see, as you see, this is from September, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they post for, for different projects what is the ratio of memory safety bugs. So they, they, they try to see if, even if project practices are very uh, well fast and they are very well tested, etc., whether this is still true for those projects. And somebody may ask, okay, 
Sure. Uh, undefined behavior is an issue, and uh, safe Rust does not have that issue, right? But since Rust has unsafe, if projects need to use a lot of unsafe code, then perhaps Rust doesn't help, right? Or perhaps because Rust is more is a more complex language than, for example, C, then programmers are going to make more bugs in Rust, and therefore perhaps that offsets uh, or even goes even worse. You, could, it could be that we have more vulnerabilities just because it's a more complex language, right? So for this, what I did is uh, to try to uh, have uh, an answer to this, a bit informal, and uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, I saw this blog post three weeks ago. It was published on the 31 of August. And this company, Adalogix, uh, were talking to a security company, published this uh, spreadsheet with uh, some projects that they've added to this uh, Google uh, project, uh, to, to fast open source projects. And they published the security bugs and the bugs that they found with a default. And since there was no column for uh, language, what I did, and this was already separated, what I did was fill that uh, language column and then I plotted now. And by plotted, and this comes with some caveats, for example, it's not normalized by line, uh, you know, a number of lines per, 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 per project. It's not, uh, some projects have two languages or three, so I picked only the, the one, the, the biggest one or the most used one for that project. I took it as, a, as that's the, the language I will pick. But again, uh, you will see why I think it's a good approximation nevertheless. So I want to here make a poll to try to get the audience a bit uh, involved uh, and to use the VPP features. Uh, so uh, this is the plot of the security bugs per project, OK, for the different languages. And you see here C, C++, Go, Python, and Rust I have not plotted, OK? So I want to make a poll, uh, and you can bet uh, I don't see the, uh, yeah, he's here, the option. okay, let me, uh, how many security bugs per project in Rust? And I will uh, put a few options, for example, one to, for example, two, two to four, four to six, six to ten, for example, it doesn't really matter. I want to see what the uh, folks, Think about uh, what is going to be the. Let me edit, sorry, one second. Okay, so I'm going to start. So you can poll what is the amount of uh, vulnerabilities that you think uh, uh, are going to appear here in the next slide. So again, this is the, basically the security bugs only, not the, all the bugs, the security bugs per language uh, per project, basically. So per project per language. Sorry. Some of you may have seen already this because I, I already presented uh, in a couple of places, but uh, yeah. Okay, some people is uh, voting. We have quite a lot of votes. Wow, 50 already have voted. Okay, so let me, let me publish the, the results uh, already. So a lot of folks think half, Roughly half think that uh, only a few, uh, others that two, four, uh, something like, for example, Python, right, or, or Go, uh, and others think like C++ or C. So, um, I don't know if I can move the poll. Can I move the poll results? I don't exactly know if I can, or how they disappear. Um, oops. If you click on the reset, that will disappear. Okay, let me see, because this, okay. Do you see a presentation because it happens on the okay. Uh, reset, where is it? Sorry, did you say? Uh, if you click on the poll the controls, then you should be able to reset. You got it. Okay, great. I, I click on the on the clear annotations, it's also work. Okay, so most folks uh, think that they will be around this play, right? So actually, it was like this. The, the plot was correct uh, since the beginning. There were zero security bugs for Rust. And I know this is a bit, uh, uh, I know it was a trick, a bit of a trick question, but yeah, there was zero security bugs per project from that uh, spreadsheet. And that's why I said, it was a, I thought it was a pretty good approximation, even if we don't account for normalization across, for example, lines of code or taking into account exactly which languages are used, where the vulnerabilities happen in, in, inside the project. So, you see. So, of course, this is security bugs. What about bugs? So, bugs. 
look like this. And I stack them because the bugs, uh, the new cities are non security bugs. So the security bugs are uh, separate, they, they don't include each other. And therefore, I did a stack plot, and this is how it looks. So Rust has uh, logic bugs, uh, let's say, let's call them logic bugs. It has logic bugs, of course. But still, as you can see also, it is quite less than the other ones, uh, the other languages. So actually, it, it's very, very good in terms of. Uh, in terms of the other languages. And again, this is with a grain of salt. This is uh, very informal, and uh, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, good uh, approximation. So what else uh, RAS offers? And I will go quick here because uh, it's, well, I cannot explain everything, but basically Rust is a nice language with a lot of uh, things like stricter type system, uh, some types, uh, lifetimes, references, etc. There is a lot of features in, in Rust which are very nice and very uh, well designed, uh, at least in general, because they could start fresh, of course, uh, compared, for example, with C++, they could start fresh and, and learn from experience. Then there is a standard library, has a lot of uh, interesting things. Uh, I love having a good standard library, especially if we could have a way to cut it or modularize it. Uh, but I think uh, having a, st a standard library, especially with, for things like vocabulary types, like resolve an option here, which I don't have time to explain, but I think those things, if you know what vocabulary types in other languages like C++ are, it's great to have this in the standard library since the beginning, because every single project is using those. Also, already agrees on, on that representation for errors, for example. And there is tooling. There is a huge amount of tooling, including the build system, cargo that you may have heard of, documentation generator, linters, great. Uh, um, IDE tooling. So there is a lot of uh, things already uh, in the ecosystem, as well, of course, as using the, the usual tools that you use for, for debugging uh, your C programs. There is Create.io, which is a place to put uh, basically open source libraries. So you put them there, and then everyone can very easily, with the build system, kind of, uh, have a dependency on. So no more uh, manually managing dependencies, like for example, in C++, or reading instructions of how to build this or that. Of course, you may still need to read the instructions of your dependencies, and you still need to pay to, in, for example, in a company, you have to take care of uh, you know, taking dependencies that are not, uh, for example, trusted enough, et cetera, et cetera. But still, it's very nice to take the complexity of the, or, or at least the majority of the build system or, or the problems that you usually see in C++ uh, and automate all of that. So what is the cuts? Uh, what's the cuts of Rust, right? One catch is that it cannot model everything, every single program. So sometimes, sometimes, and safe code is required, but it's few times. There is also more information uh, to provide to the compiler in order to model these things safely, uh, to be able, for example, to use pointer-like uh, things uh, in Rust, references. So it's a more complex language. And this is, uh, there is no denying on that. It's a more complex language. It's on the complexity level of, let's say, C++, uh, to give a rough estimation. There is extra runtime checks sometimes, so it may be potentially expensive. You always can go to unsafe code if you uh, need. So there is also a skip hat, but it's, uh, it's, it's more, uh, it can be more expensive if you, uh, if, if you don't take care, basically. So you have to really uh, think about how you are going to model your program and doing it in a way that uh, to avoid uh, uh, these things. But in a hot loop, you can still, you can, um, uh, use the skip hat, the unsafe code, to, to try to do it the, in another way or to prove it yourself that it's safe, uh, so, some uh, safety preconditions, and then you don't need to, to do the checks. But again, that's only for some cases. Not everything in Rust is checked at Rust. And then there is uh, an extra language you learn. So for existing projects, this is the major, the, the, big, the biggest problem I, I find, which is uh, you need to, to, to learn an extra language, and that's uh, sometimes a logistics and a maintenance problem. So we saw in the slides, uh, some slides ago, that why Rust uh, was a C was a good programming system programming language, and Rust the comparison is is fast. Yes, it's fast. It's a low level. Uh, sometimes you can map things to the assembly. Sometimes not. It depends on what exactly code that you're writing. It's not really simple. So this is something that is not an advantage of Rust. And if it is a domain, uh, yes, at least for kernels, embedded systems, etc., etc., it does fit down. So who is using Rust? And very quickly, I'm going to give uh, some production users. This comes from the web page of, of Rust. Uh, Mozilla has been using uh, Rust, Atlassian Systems 76, which is a hardware company. Uh, a fire service of New Zealand, uh, the fire service of New Zealand, sorry. Dropbox, Cloudflare, they are probably using it. OnePassword, Delivero, Canonical, 
etc. Also, projects that are written in Rust. There is projects already written in Rust. Servo was like a heavy duty uh, project uh, written in Rust, of course. Then there is uh, currently in production the Rust compiler and all the other tool chain uh, in Rust or based in Rust. For example, Cargo, everything is written in Rust, which is also a good uh, test best for language. Then there is Redux, which is an operating system. So there is people writing operating systems, including WIS, like you see here. Um, it's also used in virtualization by Amazon, for example, for example virtualization technology. It's also used for tool, uh, sorry, for uh, command line utilities like uh, a very fast grep alternative, or uh, an utility to measure uh, your, your programs in a, in a very easy way uh, to perform mini benchmarks, basically. So there is a lot of command line utilities within Rust because that's basically the, the easiest. Uh, probably target for a new language target, of course, but there is also graphic APIs. So WebGPU uh, has a, so this is a graphic, graphic API, sorry, written in, in Rust. It targets uh, different backends and uh, yeah, so it's using for that, it's used for that. There's, it's also used for games already. There are some games coming uh, in Rust, as you can see here. And the engines, the game engines, there are several game engines uh, projects uh, going on with their editors and everything. Uh, I give the links there in case you want to know more. Then uh, projects that are looking to take advantage of Rust, for, of course, Rust for Linux, which is the project uh, I work on uh, with all the other people. Uh, this is what the other talk we, we discuss. Uh, this project is actually supported by Prosimo, which is a memory safety project. Basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's an effort to bring uh, memory safety Rust or languages like Rust uh, to, to the most critical infrastructure. Uh, for example, NTP, uh, curl, Rust TLS, uh, Apache, etc. Et there are a lot of entities right now supporting Rust. First of all, the foundation, there's a Rust foundation nowadays. Uh, there is uh, all these huge uh, names in the industry supporting Rust and wanting to use Rust. Uh, and in the kernel, uh, I got these statements. Uh, I will not read them, but basically Google uh, wants to uh, have uh, Rust in the kernel. Also, ARM is looking to support uh, Rust, uh, including the kernel. Uh, also, Microsoft, uh, the Linux system group of Microsoft wants to use uh, Rust for their Hyper-V drivers. So there is a lot of names that I want to have uh, Rust in the kernel. And I'm glad that they allow me to, to have the statements uh, in the RFC, basically, which, uh, sorry, the past series. And that's basically it. Uh, I, I think I did it uh, quick enough to have uh, some questions if uh, we want. Uh, the conclusion is that I think uh, Rust is uh, basically a modern C model, C++, like really modern with, uh, that handles one key thing, which is undefined behavior in C and C++. There are other languages, system programming languages out there that are working, uh, they are sorry, they are growing, but some of them don't handle, or most of them don't handle uh, the undefined behavior issue like, like Rust does. Uh, there is many languages, of course, like higher languages that allow you to write memory safe code. But the key property of Rust is that it allows us to, it still allows you to use pointers like you do in C or pointer like entities as well as raw pointers. It allows you to do basically the things that you would do in C and write software like you would do almost like in, you would do in C uh, while you're still having no different behavior and keeping the, the promise of uh, memory safety, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically the key property and the, the thing that Rust has introduced into the into the into the Linux ecosystem. And uh, since I don't see the chat, uh, it hasn't loaded yet for me. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it hasn't loaded very well. We're probably going to be having to do some system, we're doing some system maintenance in the background here. But uh, the the shared notes are working, and uh, we have one it. question in the shared notes. What happens if you do divide by zero in Rust code in the kernel? So and they're raising their hands too. That's another way. I don't. I let me check quickly if I had them. Ah, sorry, I, I thought I had it in the I have it in the in the slides uh, no. assembly code. But for that case, if you divide, if you do divide by zero in, in, in Rust code, basically every division in, in, in Rust, every division of A uh, divided by B is checked. Like we saw in that function uh, in mm -hmm. C with aborts, it's basically doing that. Rust is the compiler doing that. Of course, if you can prove that B cannot be zero, it will skip the check. But otherwise, it will be guarding the division by zero. Like we're getting some more people chatting, but 
Um, Jordan, I'd like to just raise your hand. Why don't you just come off the mute microphone and turn on your camera, Jordan, and start talking. Hi, so this is a follow, oh, I gotta allow my camera. Okay, so this is just a follow up to the divide by zero question. So if it does check at runtime and find that you've divided by zero, does the kernel panic? So in the, uh, how we are doing, I mean, currently what we are doing is, uh, yes, it will trigger a Rust panic and the Rust panic will trigger in the end uh, a kernel panic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. There are other ways we could do it. We could, for example, try to kill only the, the kernel thread, for example, the kernel thread. We could, for example, if it is not a driver, uh, perhaps that's good enough in the sense that we don't kill the entire system. We give a chance to the user to recover, like rebooting, uh, saving their work, but that's still an open question, basically. How we are going to do that is an open question. Um, and should Rust kernel code be encouraged to use checked div and checked mul and similar uh, functions? I, I, I think so, yeah. I think if, I mean, not in general, perhaps, but if you, for example, if one uh, is doing something that uh, we really don't want to panic the kernel, then yes. Uh, again, this is a, these are still things that we have to see with uh, the other kernel maintainers. We have to, for example, perhaps we will discuss that in, in the next talk in the, in the kernel summit one. Uh, because these are questions that we need to see what is the, the, the best way we can do it in, in the kernel. Because yes, naked operators, uh, they will check for overflow. And for example, there are some users that want overflow checks enabled in Rust. Uh, so basically for every single operation, checking the overflow uh, and panic in the kernel otherwise. And other folks don't want that. Uh, they prefer to have the overflow. So yeah, it, it, it depends. It's, it's still a big question. Right now, for example, for the overflow checks, we have the option in key config. So you can either enable or disable the overflow checks. Uh, depending. So you can build the kernel with or without. Uh, we have, uh, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, you. Uh, we have, uh, is there any initiative towards uh, memory barriers okay. safety? No. Uh, well, there is uh, the, the memory model in, in um, the memory model in, in Rust is just basically they are borrowing the C++, the C, C++ one, and uh, it's still, I think, a work in progress. And the, the memory barriers and, in general, the memory model, I think, is, is, uh, is something that uh, actually, personally, I think, and we discussed this privately, we think that it's actually a nice opportunity for the kernel. We adopt, uh, but this is for the kernel, not more for the general user space or Rust in the in Linux in general ecosystem. But for the kernel, we think it's a good opportunity for the folks in, in the experts on memory, on the memory model to go there and try to get the memory model that they need for the kernel in Rust and have that model in, 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 in Rust because it's still open. There's a question in the chat, how much code is required? How hard is it to provide interface between C and Rust in the Linux kernel? Can you repeat, please? The question in the chat was how much code is required and how hard it, huh? is it to provide interface between C and Rust in the kernel? So that's uh, creating the abstractions, the safe abstractions for, for, for the kernel. That's the hardest part of, of, uh, of Rust in the, in, the, in the kernel, of course, because you have to understand what is the subsystem or the C subsystem doing, and you have to understand how to wrap that into a safe abstraction. But the key point is that what we are trying to achieve is that as soon as we have that and do the, we do the hard work on that, then everything else, the drivers, will be mostly safe rust. So you don't, for maintaining drivers or for writing new drivers and reviewing drivers that come into the kernel, you don't need to, to take, uh, to, to be um, worried about, uh, about uh, different behavior or memory safety issues. Uh, for example, I have another number that I got uh, in, in Congress last week, which was a Rust for Linux conference or workshop. We had uh, someone telling us that they wrote uh, independently of Rust for Linux. This was another effort. Uh, Samantha Miller was telling us that they wrote uh, a file system in Rust, in user space, but it was a file system completely in safe Rust. So many times you can write actually very, very uh, low level code in, in, in safe Rust. I mean, the kernel in, in our, one of the things we were working on uh, related to the memory map and uh, things like that. For example, for writing to an address, an arbitrary address, of course, that's never going to be safe. But what we can do is, Create at compile time the functions that know the offset to the to the region that you are uh, writing, and that can be made safe. So drivers can actually write to arbitrary in between codes, uh, uh, arbitrary uh, addresses in memory space, and they still be safe. But for that, we have to have the com at the compile time. We have to know the memory map basically. 
Uh, we have a question, how much code is required? How hard is it to provide interface between, uh, ah, yeah, it was the other, the other one. Yeah. How much code, I, I don't know, I'm not sure how to quantify that. Uh, it's not much code, it's more, I think the problem is more the complexity. Uh, how much code is not that much, it's more about the complexity because you have to take, especially in the kernel that some things are not, let's say, documented uh, too well. You have to uh, very, you have to really understand what the C code is doing, what are the APIs uh, giving you, uh, what, is the, what are the safety conditions, and put that in, in terms of uh, Rust. And, and understanding that is basically one of the major things. That's why we want, we want to have kernel maintainers on board with, with the effort so that uh, we can uh, discuss with them and they, they, because they are the experts on their subsystem or their respective subsystem. What is the overhead of calling C functions macros from Rust? Uh, Macros, there is, there is overhead there because we have to export the function as a function, not as a macro, because of course a C macro in Rust does not make sense to, to expand the macro in Rust. So there is some overhead there, uh, but on the, on the functions, just functions, uh, I don't think there is overhead in that set because it's, it's basically a function call exactly the same as, I mean, function call are the same in Rust and C, so it's just function call. Of course, if we have, for example, LTO, a cross language LTO, which is possible, then we can even decrease that and we don't even, the, we, in some cases, we may not even need the, the function code at all. Where's the Git repo of Rust for Linux? Uh, that, yeah, I, I should have put perhaps a link, perhaps in another talk, I can have the link. Uh, it's in GitHub, Rust for Linux, uh, I can copy paste into the chat. I will answer it in line with the question. Uh, not the chat, because the chat doesn't work for me, sorry. I, I put it uh, in line. What are the project goals, milestones? So we will talk about that in the, in the Rust for Linux, uh, because I, I see that the questions are more mostly related to the kernel effort, and this talk was more about uh, Rust in general. Uh, but the project goals, milestones, uh, so Linux, Linux Torvalds in a public interview, I, I read that he said that this could be 5.14, uh, as earlier that. We don't know, really, we don't know. We have to, we are here in LPC because we we have to raise these questions and this discussion with uh, other kernel maintainers, and we hope that during this week, we can talk with other kernel maintainers and try to see, especially the, the biggest question right now is not so much whether we want Rust or not, because I think most kernel maintainers, or at least uh, a lot of them have already contacted us and said, I, yeah, we, we I think this is uh, interesting and we would like to use it, but the problem is, even with that value proposition, what the problem is that we have to find a way to make the, the, the to add Rust in a way that is um, uh, not a burden to other kind of maintainers that are still learning Rust. So we have to be careful in how do we add the code, what are the responsibilities of who is maintaining what, uh, what are the implications, for example, if you want to do a subsystem wide change or a, or a tree wide change, who is going to maintain the Rust side if the Rust side is using the APIs of the C side, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is more about process right now, I think. Uh, yeah. So for me and for other folks in the project, uh, I mean, the sooner we get into, into mainland, of course, the better, because that means the decision, the decision of using Rust, which is a critical one, I think, would be already made. But the problem is that to make that decision, uh, we need, uh, yeah, we need discussion with, uh, basically, agreement with all the all the kernel community or most of the kernel community because i think rust and the kernel is not going to succeed if it is not a first person language it has to be a first person language if we just say oh this is something that some folks are doing in a corner and they have to maintain everything in the rust side then they change somebody change something in the c side the rust side breaks it's not going to work like that we have to even if there is a transition period or we find a way to make it to make somehow kernel maintainers have a window to learn Rust or things like that, we still need, uh, in the end, we need to reach the goal of having Rust as a first-class first language in the kernel. Uh, I don't see any questions, I think. I don't exactly know what is the uh, case, the, the, the time, because I, I thought, uh, sorry, I, I, I was aiming for 45. Uh, if I am going over time or something, just uh, let me know, please. Nope. I think we probably need to wrap it up in five minutes if there's still questions. Otherwise, we can wrap it up now and just resume at the top of the hour with the next speaker. All good. Thank you. Uh, and yeah. Um, 
yeah, I think um, I had some backup slides, but they are not uh, relevant for the questions that came up. Um, in the next talk, um, if you want to know more about Rust for Linux as in the in the kernel, uh, please come to the. So we are going to have in this track two more talks about Rust, and then uh, if you want to keep hearing about Rust, switch to the <laughs> kernel summit track, <laughs> and then we will discuss Rust for Linux. And there, I hope because it's also 45 minutes, I don't know how we are going to do it. I have to explain something, but I, we also want to have discussion. It's still a bit. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work, but yeah, uh, if you want discussion, we will see the, the, the yep. questions about that.